What we're trying to do here today is uh, provide a social engineering capture flag. We have two days of it. Remember, social engineering, don't believe a word he says. That's true. I was in marketing too. Um, we have two days and we want to give you guys a very unique scenario of real life situations and things to do in a way that you won't get arrested or get in trouble and practice stuff. So um, today and tomorrow we have sign up sheets and everything. Uh, today during lunch will be the first one. So it's going to be partial entertainment for the lunch crowd as well as uh, your game. Um, So we'll get started with some info. I'm going to give you some info. I'm going to give you some tips, uh, how to read people, how to do some stuff. This is not a extensive social engineering how to mess with people thing. Uh, this is just to get you guys prepped, get you some ideas, get some things thinking uh, of how to approach people and do stuff. So this is my bio slide. I don't really care to talk too much because we got a lot to do. So. There's no disclaimers because you will be hacking stuff. You will be getting into people's heads. You will be messing with people. So there's no disclaimer. Everything aside from physical harm to human beings or the property is game. Anything you guys can do or come up with, do it and use it. Just don't harm another person. Don't harm property. I guarantee you'll be able to use real life scenarios and do a lot of things you probably don't get to do legally with all this. So what we're doing is day one we're doing cyber speed dating. So what that's going to do for you is give you a scenario in which that you can cold read a person very quickly and try to get some information out of them. What I'll do is when we're done with this I'll hand out some uh, little questions for everyone who's participating. You have six questions with a seventh bonus question. You have to go around and ask these to the people in the speed dating scenario. You have two minutes to get those six pieces of information out of them. So it's gonna require you to plan ahead and figure some things out. We'll get into some tips and pointers on that. But the most important thing is, is try to get as much information as the person as fast as possible when you only have two minutes. When the two minutes is up, a whistle or someone will yell or do a duck call or whatever, get up, move to the next table, it starts all over again. And during this scenario, I'll hand out these sheets for you. You have results one through six with the seventh bonus question. Just write down the notes of what happened. Did you get the person to do it? Who'd you talk to? What'd you get out of them? Keeping it very simple and uh, easy to use. Later on, what that feeds into is a final report. Just like in the real world, you're going to have to do a report. So in order to win both days, you have to have a full report filled out. Uh, it's just like the real world. So. The second day, uh, just to give you a preview, the second day what's going to happen is you're going to line up for a job interview. What we're going to do is three minutes before your job interview, I'm going to hand you a resume. You have to assume that identity on that resume. You're then going into the job interview with the sole point and perspective of a red team member who's trying to get information out of a company to conduct an attack. This is a very, very effective real life scenario. Just got done doing this with uh, several people. The best part about it is, is when you go in for a job interview, think about it. They ask you questions about you, they interview you and everything, but they also just spill out everything about their company. They brag about their company. Sometimes they take you on a tour of the facility. It's one of the easiest ways to get into a company and wreak havoc. So I want you guys to have that experience and try that. Not only do you have to extract information out of the people interviewing you, you need to maintain your cover. So someone asks you a question like, where are you from? And you told them one question, one thing, and you say another thing later on, that's a red flag that could get you in trouble. So again, final report is a really big deal, just like in the real world. It's kept pretty simple. I made it very, very easy for you guys. We're mainly trying to get you guys into the method of thinking ahead and how to do stuff. So day one results, just record them down on a sheet of paper for the, uh, the people that you go through an interview. Uh, hold on to that for tomorrow. We'll also hand out the packet for the final report. You can look through that, take it home with you tonight, read through it. It's also uh, very good to plan your attack for tomorrow. 
So you might want to do research. We've posted some fake company information, even a network diagram on our website. You can check out, start looking through, get some ideas, start developing a premise and pretext to use tomorrow. So one thing to do in all this is uh, to think about a few things such as pivoting your attacks, how pivoting works differently from um, adapting. Adapting, you simply adapt to the change and you move around and you move on. Pivoting is a little different. Pivoting your attack in social engineering, I want you to think about uh, a small child. Small child wants a toy. They go to their mother and ask their mother, hey, I want this toy, I want this toy, I want this toy. The mother provides resistance and tells the child, you know, go fuck off, go ask your dad. <laughs> So the kid goes, but he maintains the same attack. He just pivots the attack to the father, asks the same question, dad, 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 I want a toy, I want a toy. Keep that in mind. When you encounter resistance in social engineering, don't just sit there and drop everything and turn tail and run off. Stop, think real quickly what you have at hand, and pivot your attack. Maybe they said no to a question. So today in the speed dating scenario, maybe you directly ask a person a question. Maybe you, they just go back and say no. You can't just stop right then and there and go, well, fuck, they said no, better move on. One thing you could do is ask them another question, get what their answer is on that, and maybe go back and revisit the other question. Or maybe take that question that failed, ask it with different language. Or use it in a maybe a story scenario. Present it to them to get information out rather than directly asking them. Another thing to do is study your target ahead of time. When you're running around for the speed dating and you sit down, before you sit down, take a quick look at the target and notice things about them. Notice things to identify commonalities and things to set up rapport. And I'll introduce a little thing to help you with that. Also, when you're going through, watch for contradictions. We'll get into that when uh, language doesn't uh, sync up with your body language. Uh, it's a key indication of either someone's lying or concealing information, or it's maybe a, a point you need to focus on for your attack. The biggest thing today and tomorrow in all these capture the flags is keep it simple. We've had people uh, overcomplicate things, and that's when they get frustrated and lose. Keep everything simple. In our industry, we overcomplicate everything in our industry. And as long as you keep it simple today, you're just going to rip right through it. And if you keep it simple tomorrow, you'll rip right through it. So pivoting, again, just when you encounter an obstacle, you present an idea. You either uh, plan it out and do recon. So in the case of a kid wanting a toy, he knows he wants a toy. He's going to go figure out, well, I can't buy the toy. I'm going to go ask my parents. So you have your plan and recon, and you execute it. Then you get your outcome. Your outcome being that, oh, I asked mom. Mom said no. So you have a negative outcome. At that point, you can go back and reevaluate the resistance and see if you can just execute the same thing again, like ask mom again for the toy, or maybe cry. Or... If you have flat out resistance and there's no way in hell you're getting anywhere, say you're asking the cheerleader ahead of the cheerleader squad out for a date, she just says flat out no, that's probably a good point where you just want to just say, hey, let's just start over and go move on. But again, pivoting is very, very powerful when you do social engineering. Don't just drop dead and move on. Stop, look at what you have at hand and move around. Rephrase things, re-ask things, do things a little differently. And again, keep it simple and stupid, K-I-S-S, -S, keep it simple, stupid. Just keep everything simple. Do not do an elaborate plan. If you guys watch like Burn Notice and Leverage and shit, they have these huge plans and there is no fucking way in the real world that's going to work. The more you complicate a plan and the more perfect a plan it is, the higher the probability it's going to fail because you have all these little things you've got to make sure lines up and everything. Always take the direct approach. So in the real world, an uh, uh, offhanded example is if you've got to pick a lock to break into somewhere, far easier to take a brick and throw it through the window and go in that way that, rather than pick the lock. Keep everything simple throughout this whole process. So a quick tip on reading people. I'm not going to get into the Sherlock Holmes kind of crap and everything. I'm going to keep it very simple for you guys. Is Break everything up into the rule of thirds. Just like in photography, you break things into the rule of thirds so you can frame a shot. Just like with that with people, 
you can break it up into thirds. So when you sit down or you approach a person, divide it up with the shoulders and above for the head, shoulders to the uh, waist area being the torso, and then the legs. Rather than you know encompassing a whole picture of a person looking at them real quick, break it up into thirds. You can look at their torso and above, the upper top, see if they got piercings, see what's on their face, see what their uh, expression is, see if they're chewing gum or something. The torso is always going to stay pretty static. It might give you indications if someone's leaning back in a chair. They might be a little more relaxed, open to things if they're leaning back or if they have feet on the table. They'll be more open to things, but the torso is probably the easiest thing to look at and see. It's also the most static. Legs are great because with legs, you can see if a person has them crossed or if they're doing stuff. Or the best part is the hyperactive uh, leg shake thing. So we'll get back into that for contradictions. A contradiction to this would be like, yeah, I'm perfectly fine. I'm, I'm, I'm relaxed. I'm a-okay, but my leg is going 1,000 miles per hour. It's a key indication that, well, this dude might be pretty nervous or he's lying about something or there's something else afoot. You need to explore that. But divide people up into thirds rather than doing a whole picture or a quick scan. Just divide up into thirds. So that way, when you're going through uh, even the speed dating, you can read languages and changes in just little separate areas. Even if a person is sitting or if they are uh, only facing you with only a bit of information, say the torso or higher, you can still divide it out into thirds and get a lot of information like, the eyes, the face, hands, and torso, you can see a lot of bit of information there uh, and divide it out rather than going in for the whole picture. The whole point of all this is to keep things very simple because you have no time at all to do really anything. There's no time for elaborate like Sherlock Holmes style reading of shit. Just go for the obvious and the plain. So divide stuff out. Maybe when you're doing the speed dating, sit down, see how the people are uh, sitting see how their legs are, see what the expression is on their face. Uh, another thing is the contradictions. Again, what someone says to you and what their body language is should sync up. When it syncs up, nine times out of ten, they're telling the truth and it's A-OK. -okay. No one can tell the tr uh, uh, perfect lie and keep it going, so that's why you want to look for little things like is the guy's leg jittering? Is he scratching? Does he do something when he talks? So sometimes uh, you'll see poker players do stuff or people talking and you can see when someone lies when they might do something like, well, I don't know, you know, or maybe they brush their mouth, touch their nose, or do something with their face or hands, or if they talk a lot with their hands while they're doing stuff, maybe when they're lying or trying to withhold information, they stop. But the perfect way to tell people, rather than going for micro expressions and all these other really cool high level stuff, just look to see with what they're saying lines up with their body language. And if you can't tell, what you want to do is sit there and watch their habits, see what they do over time. That's what a lot of uh, poker players do. And uh, a lot of times it happens in police interrogations and stuff. They look for your habits and see what happens. Uh, another thing that you can use in your arsenal is distractions or uh, disruptions. And there's a key difference here between distraction and disruptions. A distraction would be I pull down my pants right now and go, woo! You guys will just sit there and go, well, that was uncalled for. And um, that solved nothing, but the class is going to go on. Distraction doesn't do anything for the long term. A disruption is one, something you want to use. Think of it as hitting control C or like a knob sled. So if you're in the middle of, say, talking and speed dating and someone is just yammering on and you can't get them to shut the hell up, what you might do is just get up, stretch, violate, and uh, disrupt their space. They were used to you sitting there talking straight ahead to them. They had a comfort zone and level. You might just get up and stretch and go, ah, oh, I'm sorry, I've been flying all day. Ah, reach around, stretch, get up, walk around. You've disrupted their space and their comfort zone, or if it's an extreme, you might get up and walk around to them, maybe talk to them or shake their hand or do something. But you're disrupting the space 
and the, what that gives you is an ability to inject something else in at that time. So maybe you get up and yawn while someone's yammering on, and you tell them, ah, oh, you know, I just was traveling a long ways. By the way, have you ever fill in the blank, use a question? Or another way to uh, disrupt someone who is talking on and on and on, do something simple and benign like look at your watch or something of that nature. You don't want to go to extremes on that. An extreme situation would be, um, I used to do music magazines and interview people. I had to interview Aphex Twin, who was notoriously a shy guy and a bit of an asshole. And whenever you talked to him, he was going to only talk about his new album. He wasn't going to talk about anything else. So you have to take control of that situation. What I did is he would not shut up. I asked him, hey, can you draw a picture of yourself sodomizing the Virgin Mary? <laughs> right then and there, it was a dead drop, and it was quiet, and he asked, excuse me? Right then and there, I injected a question. I go, so you did this album, but what about your tour, or what about this? I don't suggest that a kind of extreme, but you kind of see, inject something in to disrupt, take control and dominate the conversation. And that's another thing you guys are going to need to be cognizant of during the speed dating is you only have two minutes. And if you get someone talking too much on one question, it's going to eat up all your time. So think about taking control of the situation and you might have to disrupt them, stand up, yawn, get up. Uh, if you're ever in a boardroom, one thing that works good, if you have a bunch of C-level executives that are just yakking, get up, practice golf swings. But again, remember, a distraction is only going to serve you for a couple seconds and forget and not serve you well. Disruption is going to let you inject stuff into the conversation that you want to do so you can grab control. Again, keep it simple and stupid. Kiss. All the uh, CTS that we've done, People have overcomplicated stuff, and it's killed them. So if you have any questions, this is how to reach me. So what we're going to do here, and uh, I'm going to open up to questions and stuff. What we're going to do is, as soon as this is done, I need you guys to come down. We have the questions here. These questions don't show it to anyone because we're still trying to get some volunteers to participate as the interviewees that you're going to interview. Take the questions, guard them, do not disclose them to anyone. Because if the guy across the table finds out that question, he's going to make your life hell. And it's already going to be hard as it is. Anyways, um, we'll ask you guys to pick up several of these sheets for the day one results for the speed dating. Again, you have slot one through six. Just write down the answer to the question that you received and who the person was. If you can get bonus question number seven, do that. And then... When we move on to um, day two, let's see here. You'll get more into the packets. The packets have some pretty simple questions, such as uh, explain the process used on day one. We're just looking for what did you do, what did you think ahead of, how did you ask the questions. We're leaving it pretty wide open for you to interpret and put whatever in you want. What we're looking for is if the report is completely filled out. That's going to dictate the winner. If you submit everything and a fully completed report, that's how you're going to win. In Vegas, the team that won in Vegas, they had a completed report, and that's ultimately how they won. Um, other things here, just kind of phrasing on how you felt you did, what did you do, what would have you done differently. We're keeping it simple and very open to interpretation. I just want to get you guys introduced to how you would start approaching social engineering from a reporting perspective as well as how you would use it in real life. Day two, uh, we'll make some announcements later tonight and tomorrow. We're going to have isolated classroom for day two. What we're going to have you do is line up outside. We have some professors at the university that will be conducting the job interviews. Uh, we'll come out one at a time, hand you your resume, three minutes, read the resume, get your ideas, uh, assume the identity, go into the job interview. It's going to be a standard job interview. But sit there tonight and think about things that you could do and ask. Maybe ask them, well, is it my responsibility to do antivirus patching or uh, pa patching for updates? And they might go, well, yes, it is. Then you can lead into that and go, well, how often do you update? Answer might be, well, we 
have WSUS server and we haven't figured out how to do it yet so we don't patch. That would be something to note. You need to keep the perspective of going into the job interview, how to get the information out for you to do a red team pen test later on. Because part of day two on the report, you have to write out your planned idea for an attack based off the information that you got. So tonight and today, go to our website, check out the company info. Uh, you're going to be attacking a company called Cloudwasher Incorporated. They do uh, cloud washing. They wash the cloud. They get rid of malware and everything out of the cloud. It's a load of crap. But you can read through everything and get information that you need. Form an attack tonight. Think about it. Think about how you want to attack them. There's a network diagram, too. You could use that to phrase questions like, well, I see you have this product line. Do you patch it? Or where is it? Or where's your DMZ? What, what, how expansive is your network? How many people do you have working off-site? Things like that. You can start asking questions that may seem benign during a job interview, but it's going to give you a perspective of, oh, well, they don't patch. They have no idea about their geographic boundary of the network. They have no testing for phishing or security awareness. Maybe I'll do a phishing attack and fish the shit out of them and then maybe follow up with just plugging in a laptop at their business. You could ask them about if they have security policy for uh, bringing your own devices in. But just start thinking ahead tonight. Read the information, see what you can get, start asking questions, and uh, get everything put in together for that. Because tomorrow is going to be a little more extensive. Today at lunch, uh, meet downstairs in the cafeteria area. There's a bunch of chairs out there. Meet down there. Uh, we'll have everything set up and start asking questions. Remember, absolutely keep it short and simple and stupid because you have two minutes to get six questions out of a person. You will not get all six, but try as hard as you can and use everything in your SE toolbox. Again, the only rules, no physical harm to people, no physical harm to property. Everything else is a go. Do the most malicious things you can to get information out of people. So this is going to give you an opportunity to test, try, do whatever you want that you haven't been able to do in the real world. And tomorrow especially. Tomorrow, anything goes again. Just no physical harm to people or property. You might even uh, go home tonight and figure out some props or something to help out with the job interview. But again, the information for tomorrow is up online. Get the premise and pretext going. And... Um, if there's no questions, I'll pass out information to you guys, but do any of you have any questions? And um, two more tips for you guys. If you hack my website, you will not get any answers. It's been hacked two times already for this. There's no answers online. <laughs> and um, also, uh, offering to buy me drinks and trying to social engineer me will not get you any information for the capture flag here as well as Vegas. What's happening in Vegas, these, all these little local events are leading up to Vegas in 2013. We are having a massive, massive CTF in Las Vegas B-sides. Uh, you'll be able to do all sorts of scenarios uh, involving the hotel staff, uh, the hotel perimeter, everything. Uh, you might have to invade a call center. You might have to social engineer people out of a call center. You might have to t uh, attack an Outlook uh, website. Um, it's literally going to be one of the largest CTFs ever planned. Anything goes. If you guys want to DOS other people, you can do that. But we're leading up to this. But what happens is when you get the trophy or you win little pieces of information, those are things that are going to help you out. So whoever wins the squirrel trophy, there's something hidden in the trophy that will help you out with uh, Las Vegas. There might be RFID in it. There might be um, a transmitter of some sort. There might be a who knows in there it's going to give you an advantage in Vegas. So if you collect all these pieces for all these CTFs or you talk to someone else who's gotten them, you can use them to your advantage in Vegas. If you want an example of that, we still have the Fort Worth, uh, Dallas-Fort Worth B-sides up and the Topeka, Kansas uh, thing up. You can get on there, you can play with them and figure them out. So if you guys don't have any questions, we'll hand out uh, information here and we'll get started at lunch. Um, we'll, we'll meet downstairs in the... Uh, cafeteria area and we'll get going there.